Happy New Year. It was an incredible week of fasting and prayer, and there's just something about the collective body together lifting his name and interceding for each other. And it was culminated yesterday when we came together across a Zoom call from People's Church LA all the way to Dubai, from Croatia to Honduras, Cape Town to St. Louis, Cincinnati. And it was really precious as leaders, lay leaders from each church prayed for the next church through that call. And just pages of Zoom callers on that uh, collective time together. And you know, one of the things the Lord did is we came together Wednesday night in prayer in this room. And as we've been praying throughout the year, a quarterly week of fasting and prayer, is he's answering prayers that only he could answer in his way, in his timing. Quick example. I didn't know. It was a God thing. But I was invited to pray at the inaugural the swearing in of the new city council. So at Music Hall this last Tuesday, I was there praying over them and then having the opportunity, this very council that will be voting on our project in just a few months, Lord willing, and I'm getting to know them and hear them. Jan and I were sitting there prayerfully. In fact, I'd asked the Lord for words to share in the prayer. Keep a short prayer, that's important but powerful with words that he gives. And the words that he gave me were showing up in their three-minute speeches after they were sworn in. So they'd have family members standing with them, get sworn in, then they'd walk up on the stage and give a three-minute speech. Their passion, their unity as a team, it's pretty amazing really how they sound together uh, as, a, as a unit wanting to see flourishing, which God gave me to pray. Creativity, which God gave me to pray. Collective wisdom, which the Lord gave me to pray over them. And I just sat there going, Lord, you're amazing. And then concluded with, Father, your will in Cincinnati as it is in heaven. And then I said, forgetting where I was, and everyone said, and the whole room went, amen. I was like, well, that worked out. That worked out. I mean, you know, there's people who are Hindu background, Muslim background, blah, 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 Jewish. And I'm like, well, okay. Whoo. But anyway, God allows things like that to take place because he's coordinating from heaven what he wants to do the way he wants to do it. And prayer is part of that. So thank you for your part working hard in prayer and adding fasting to that quarterly in the year is so amazing. Uh, Thank you. Who you were made to be. That is this series that the Lord's put on our hearts for this first month of the year. And I want to share from an incredible psalm, very personal, the way David is writing to the Lord and the things that are being said to all of us through what he writes in this maybe the most personal psalm or even chapter of the Bible in all the Bible, Psalm 139. I just want to read a couple of verses for right now. I praise you, Lord. Because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm in verse 14. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. Your very frame, your very being, your body, your personality, none of you was hidden from him as he knitted you together as your creator. Your loving God, your loving Father. Lord, in this series, would you speak to every heart how personally you love us and that your plans for us and through us are full of joy. There might be tests, there might be trials, there will be sorrows, but deep down, God, your purposes, they prevail for every life that surrenders to you that you can use like water coursing through your hands, you can direct it. Lord, would we be like that in your hands? In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I was 11 or, or 12 years old. I was on a baseball field in a little town east of Cincinnati called Owensville. Has anyone here ever heard of Owensville? A lot more than I thought, about 25 of us. That's pretty amazing, really, because I had never heard of Owensville, and I'm on a baseball field. I'm 11 or 12, and I'm playing in a game that's in the last inning 
There's a runner on third, and I'm a few strides out from first base playing defense, getting ready for the batter to swing the bat, the pitcher to throw the pitch in. We're up by a run, and there's two outs, and you may not know a lot about baseball, but baseball's a very slow game except for when it gets quick. <laughs> the pitcher is throwing the ball. We're not very old, so maybe it's coming in at 50 miles an hour, but it's moving. The batter's starting to swing the bat, and from the angle of the bat and the, and the speed of the pitch, I have a sense that this ball from a right-handed batter is coming to my right. I don't know how you know that. It's kind of an innate thing as you're, as you're in a game. Have, has anybody ever played soccer or, or croquet? Or ping pong? And you kind of have a sense sometimes of where to go next. I felt that. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm wet ready, and all of a sudden there's a line drive, and I'm moving to my left before it even strikes. I feel like it was like that. I don't know. But the next thing I know, like Spider-Man, I'm like spread across in the air, <laughs> catching a line drive two feet above the ground. <laughs> I hit the ground. I jump up like it's the World Series. The team rushes onto the field. We've won the game. They pick me up, and the coach tosses me in the air. And I thought to myself, this is what I've been made to be. A baseball player. <laughs> well, I went on to play, you know, a little bit of high school ball, small college ball, and I got to play with guys that went on to the big leagues, but I was a small league player. It was not what I was made to be, <laughs> but God does give us those things for joy, for fun, for memories. I still think about a lot of different things that happened in the, on the soccer field or on the, on the baseball field in, in my life. I think less about what happens on the golf course because it's not as many good memories. But <laughs> these things are joy to us, but they're not usually not what we're made to do except for a handful of people in all of society, right? But the Lord does know what he's made you to do. And he knew what he'd done for me. And in my college years, he began to speak deeply to my heart about the things he's made me to do and be. Abram and Sarai were a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, living with Abram's father and a nephew and other family members in Ur, or Ur, the land of the Chaldeans. This story is very early in the Bible. It's in Genesis chapter 11, and it's really the beginning of the salvation story in many ways, a missions story, God calling people being sent. In fact, it really starts with Abram's dad, Terah, and we'll see that here in Genesis 11, verse 30, 31. Terah took his son, Abram, his grandson, Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law, Sarai, the wife of his son, Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. Terah, Abram's father, had a vision to go to Canaan. Have you ever seen that before? But when they came to Haran, spelled differently than his uh, nephew or his son, they settled in Haran. Terah lived 205 years and he died in Haran. So they leave this place, which is all the way out uh, the uh, Euphrates River in Iraq today, and they go uh, west along that, where you would pivot to go south into what we know as the Promised Land or Israel today. They, they stay there, and at the elbow of that turn, stop, and Terah lives out the rest of his days. We don't know if they were there many years or decades. We don't really know. But what we know is what happens in the next verse. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. So the fact that it's called your country, they probably had lived there a long time at that point. I will make you, Abram, into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth 
will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old, remember that, when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. They, they knew where places were based on landmarks like the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. But Shechem ends up being an important place just a few hundred years later when the children of Israel, after slavery in Egypt, have wandered through the desert, have conquered Jericho, have now come to Shechem, and it's there that they read out loud the covenant of the Lord, the blessings and the curses. So Shechem is a place of obedience where Abraham obeyed the Lord, or Abram at this point obeys the Lord, and later God blesses the children of Israel there when they are in the hundreds of thousands. But at this moment, he's in a land he's never been in before, and he has no children. But the Lord says to him, To your offspring, I will give this land. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now, just a couple of chapters later, there's an interesting next part of the story. Chapter 17, verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old. How old? In the last chapter we read, how old was he? 75. 24 years have passed. And the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations, and I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for your generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants. Wow. Wow. Verse 15, God also said to Abraham, as far as Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and, and, and will surely give you a son by her. You got to understand, at 75, the Lord said, I'll give you many descendants in this place. It's now 24 years later. And Sarah, who's now, well, Sarai, who's now going to be called Sarah and Abram still have no children together. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come after her and from her. The Lord does this amazing thing and her name is changed to Sarah. Twists and turns. But it all happens as the Lord says it will happen. Abram's name initially means exalted father, and then as it's changed, means father of many. Sarai is the pronunciation of her name back, all the way back in the land of Ur. But now she's given the pronunciation in the new promised land, the, the same pronunciation that the Canaanites would use. Both of her names, now her new name, Sarah, means princess. They had a promise. They had a calling. They stepped out in faith in it. And it was something that had been spoken to the heart of Abram's father before that. Something about this land called Canaan. But decades have passed and still nothing had happened. So let's fast forward to the book of Hebrews to get this next part of the story. The book of Hebrews, 
chapter 11. Now in the New Testament, and it says this, it says, by faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. So now we learn there was a son, Isaac, Jacob, the grandson, for Abram was, Abraham was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. He had a vision in his spirit. The Lord had called him to something. Here's the question for us to think about today and in this series. Who has God called you to be? Who has he made you to be? I'm going to take some insights from this story of Abraham and Sarah. The first thought is this. Some of God's purposes in your life may be things that started in the hearts of your parents or your grandparents. Our God is a God of generations. He's a God who thinks in the now and acts in the now, but he also has the long view of all of eternity. And there are things that he's put, putting in your heart today that are for your descendants to come that will be fulfilled in their lives. But it matters as to how well, and if you step out on obedience in your years, not perfectly so, but in the process as you're growing and learning, following after him. Another thought or insight from Abraham and Sarah's lives is this. Some of God's purposes for your life may be unfolding over the course of decades. And we often get impatient when it doesn't happen this year or this month or this week, right? And when we're young, a year seems like a long time. As we get older, the decades seem quick. This week I was with a friend who was saying, yeah, my son, he said to me as it turned New Year's, he said, wow, Dad, I remember when it turned 2020. <laughs> Dad looked at his son and said, son, I remember when it turned the year 2000. And as I listened to that, I thought, I remember looking at a McDonald's menu for a kid's uh, Happy Meal that had 1980 on it. And some of you here remember when the decades turned to 1960 or earlier. <laughs> some of God's purposes happen over time. And what we see in the book of Hebrews is that indeed it took place. For Abraham was looking, and Sarah, for a city, to the city with foundations which, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And then the writer of Hebrews goes on to say that all of these people that he's talking about, because it's not just Abraham and Sarah that he talks about in this chapter. He goes back and talks about Enoch and, and Noah and others. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promises, promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Wow. God's purposes, they may happen quickly. They may happen this month or this spring. He's at work, and sometimes he expedites. And in fact, what happens at, at 99, and, and I don't know, I guess uh, Sarah would have been about 89 when they got that promise again, is that a year later they have Isaac. So that happened quickly. But the initial promise, the initial prompting and calling of God out from what they were comfortable doing was a calling that lasted for a long time, seemingly had God had passed them over. Seemingly the calling, they had misheard him, but they hadn't. And they continued to trust the Lord. Not perfectly. They made mistakes along the way. We have the whole story of Ishmael. As a result of their, 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 their kind of stopping to totally trust the Lord. They were human. We are human. And so that's why this third thought comes to mind. You might be changed in the process of discovering what God has made you to be. 
And it's okay. In fact, it can be amazing. Amazing. Back to Psalm 139. This intimate psalm from the Lord to you. Imagine you're David writing this to the Lord. Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down. You know when I stand up. You, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is even on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and, and, and before and you lay your hand upon me. You're a protector of me. Such knowledge is too wonderful. Too lofty for me to understand, to attain to. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee if I wanted to from, from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths of the ocean, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast, the hand of your strength. If I say, surely the darkness will crush or erase me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you, Lord. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is light to you. For you created my inmost being and you knit me together in my mother's womb. The Lord knows you. He doesn't just see you, He knows you. He doesn't just know you. He made you. He loves you. You're on purpose. Don't ever let the enemy tell you you were an accident. That is a lie from hell. You're on purpose, and he has incredible purposes to accomplish through your life. There's no one else like you, and there never has been, and there never will be. You are uniquely whom he created you to be. And he loves you so much. So begin this year knowing how much He loves you, how precious you are to Him, and knowing how on purpose you are. Because when we get a sense of who He's made us to be, our trust is in Him and our surrender is unto Him. Because when we've surrendered our life to Him, we can't go wrong. The Bible says, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 3, that the steps of those who are surrendered to Him are ordered of Him. What I love about that proverb is this idea that if I'm surrendering my life to Him, like on a daily basis, I wake up in the morning and say, Lord, my life is Yours, not my own, my life is Yours. I can be confident as that is the posture of my heart, that in that day, I'm not going to make mistakes that are going to derail my life or somebody else's. If that's the posture of my heart, then I'm like that water course in his hands that he can guide and direct. Not because I know what to do, but because he knows what to do. But he needs permission because he's decided to do it that way. He's given us the ability to say yes or to say no. But what's amazing is, we might go through some days where we're messing it up or some months or even some years. And when we say yes to him again, it's back on track. And then he takes everything that was a mess behind us and he cleans it up and puts it in the ministry. The impact of our lives. <laughs> he lets it add to the wisdom of our days and, and, and of our influence for the good and the, and, and, the, and the good God things of his life for others that he wants to give through us. So we don't have to live in abject guilt or under crushing sorrow. There are things that cause us sorrow. And there are things for the rest of our lives for which we'll be repentant for, but we don't have to wallow in shame. Because Abram, Abram and, and, and Sarai, they, they messed up. They went a different direction for a season, but the Lord still came through. And as they surrendered their lives to him, it began the ancestry of Jesus. Do you realize that? That's why that story is so important. That began the human ancestry of Jesus. It's the beginning of the salvation story through ordinary people 
who hear in their hearts step out and they stepped. That obedience brings the purposes of God into the lives of people, into your life and through your life. So to review these thoughts from the stories of Abraham and Sarah, some of God's purposes in your life may be things that started in the hearts of your parents and grandparents. In other words, there's a place for being thankful to God for a praying great-grandmother, a praying grandfather, a praying mom or aunt or dad or stepdad. You see, the Lord has put into all of our lives children or the next generation. You might say, well, Chris, I'm, I'm single. <laughs> well, Chris, we're, we're, we're married, but we've never been able to have children. Yeah, but we're a family as the church of Jesus Christ. And we have young people that are part of the youth ministry here called United. And we have children who are part of the children's ministry called Peeps. And we invest in them. We are a church together investing in them. Your life pouring into their life is also your generations in the Lord. Some of us have fostered and, and adopted. Some of us have had children biologically. Some of us now have grandchildren. or We have nieces and nephews that we pour our life into. We are pouring in for generations it matters what we're praying over them now. It matters how we model for them now. It matters that we're obeying the Lord and telling them the stories now, which will be seeds in their life for decades to come. Some seeds which will not bear a harvest for maybe 50 years. Can you tell having a grandson makes me think longer? It just does. But so do the Scriptures. Because we have the stories of people who went to their earthly grave and their spirit went to be with the Lord and they joined that cloud of witnesses. People who didn't, while they were walking this earth, see the dream fulfilled. But they're seeing it now. They're seeing it now. And so will we. In everything that God is doing, some things will happen fast and we'll see it with our own eyes. Some things will happen after us until the day of the Lord. That next thought that I shared was that some of God's purposes for your life may be unfolding over the course of much time. So be patient. Persevere. There's so much in the scripture about perseverance. There's so much about steadfastness. There's, there's so much about consistency. The things of this world always are distracting us. And we're going to have times when we go off, kind of go off the track or the path of the way of the Lord. We're going to have times where we're maybe not in our best, at our best in obedience unto Him for His purposes in our life. But here's the thing. You can always come back on path. His grace is sufficient for you. And some things, through that process, He's using them to change us. And that is the Lord forging the image of His Son Jesus in you. Growing His character in us. Developing the fruit of the Spirit. Growing the wisdom of the Lord in us. <laughs> Sharpening His the skills and the talents from Him that He's placed in us. Causing us uh, and allowing us to be even better stewards of His purposes in our lives. So the thing to do is to let Him work His change in you. We are being made into disciples. And the, and the younger that we grasp these things, the deeper the impact of His life in us and through us in the days that we actually walk the earth until He comes or we go to be with Him. But here's the thing. You might be in your 80s and there's still time for the impact of your life every single day because He's changing us. So Lord, we just pray that You would help us 
to know how much you really love us. To begin to seek to understand who you've made us, you've made us to be. And that you're even at work changing our identity from the old nature to the new. Just like Abram became Abraham. From father to father of many. Or, or, or the pronunciation, not in the old nature, but in the new. Lord, would you, with your loving smile and your warm embrace, just wrap your arms around each one of us, reminding us we're your daughter, we're your son, and there is much, much good that you want to accomplish in us and through us. In Jesus' name I pray.